brought your Bibles, and I trust that you did, turn with me to the book of Joshua, chapter 14. I'm going to read verses 6 through verse 14. As always, I'd ask you if you can and will to stand with me for the reading of the Word, and then just remain standing for our offertory hymn. The sons of Judah drew near to Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Japhonai the Kenziite, and said to him, You know the word which the Lord spoke to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was Jason's age when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. That's what it says, isn't it? Okay. And I brought word back to him as it was in my heart. If you don't remember that word was God has promised us this land, let's go get it. But the majority report was, can't do it, there are giants in there. Hmm. Nevertheless, my brothers who went up with me, made the heart of the people melt with fear. But I followed the Lord my God fully. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land on which your foot has trodden will be an inheritance to you and to your children forever, because you have followed the Lord my God fully. <clears throat> now behold, the Lord has let me live just as he spoke. These 45 years from the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses when Israel walked in the wilderness, and now behold, I'm 85 years old today. And I am still as strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, so my strength is now. For war, for going out and coming in. Now then, give me this hill country about which the Lord spoke on that day. Have you heard on that day that the Anakim were there? And with great fortified cities. Perhaps the Lord will be with me, and I will drive them out as the Lord has spoken. So Joshua blessed him and gave him Hebron, or gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Japhonah, for an inheritance. Therefore, Hebron became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Japhonah, the Kenziite, until this day, because he followed the Lord God of Israel fully. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Some time ago I ran across an item, an article, in a newspaper that uh, caught my attention. So I clipped it out. It was a story about a lady by the name of Doris Eaton Travis. She was a history major at the University of Oklahoma. And upon graduation, she had received the Horace Peterson Memorial Award as the outstanding undergraduate history major. The chairman of the department wrote this. Doris is always up on every assignment, always enters classroom discussion, always asks relevant questions. Her GPA was 3 Point six one. Now I'm sure some of these students here are going to maintain a 4.0, but a 3.61 is pretty good, isn't it? But what made Doris different than most other students is the fact that at that time she was 87 years young. It is hard to read the story here about Caleb without picking up on the fact that he was 85 years old at the time of his mountain climbing. Age, for the most part, is a mindset, isn't it? I recall uh, when I was taking Hebrew at, at Southern Seminary, it was one of the last courses I took because I was having trouble trying to get a schedule for it. And they had the bright idea of offering it in a summer term, which meant that it was much shorter uh, duration of time, but the class was three hours a day, five days a week. 
And we were in the second week, I think, when we had a visitor and the professor introduced him as a potential student. And at that time, it may still be that way, Southern Seminary was the only one of, the, of our schools that required Hebrew and Greek for a Master of Divinity degree. So he sat in there, and then we had break, and when we were out in the break room, I saw him and went down and sat down beside him and said, well, what do you think? He said, I think I'm going to Southwestern. But that reminded me that there was a lady in our class that was probably not in her 80s, but at least in her 70s. Her family was grown, of course. Her husband had passed away. She said she'd been a church librarian as a volunteer in her church most of her life. and She always wanted to study languages, and she took Hebrew. Caleb was 85. But I want to suggest to you that the point of this passage is not the age of Caleb. It is something completely different. Look in verse 8. Caleb stated that the hill country was promised to him by God 45 years earlier because I followed the Lord my God fully. You see that phrase? In verse 9, Moses said about Caleb, You have followed the Lord my God fully. In verse 14, Joshua speaking, and he says about Caleb, Because he followed the Lord God of Israel fully. Now, I've mentioned this many times before, but I want this to burn deeply in your mind. When something is mentioned two times and three times, God's not pulling a prank on you to make it harder to read through the Bible. It is for emphasis so that we will get it, that we will understand it. Do you recall that Isaiah went to the temple? And there he had a vision of God high and lifted up. And he saw the seraph. What were they saying? Holy, holy, holy. Why three times? Emphasis and to get our attention. Here three times it's stated that Caleb had followed the Lord fully. We sometimes sing a song. I've had numerous requests not to sing. So let me recite the first stanza of faith is the victory. Encamped along the hill of light, ye Christian soldier, rise. You ever notice that this is a militant song? You know why? We can try to take it out of our hymn books if we want to, but we're at war. We're at war with unholy forces. He says, and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing, the glowing night. Get busy before night fall. Do what you can while the opportunity is before you. Against the foe in veil below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. You know what the problem is? So many of God's soldiers are AWOL. They, they're just not in the battle at all. If 2014 is going to be a successful year for me and a successful year for you, if it is going to be the most that we have ever accomplished, then we need to duplicate the faith I want you to notice three things about his faith that we need to copy. First of all, there is his and therefore there needs to be our dedication to fulfill that divine purpose. Look at verse 10 again. Now behold, the Lord has let me live just as he spoke. You know what Caleb was saying? I'm here today. And that means that God has a purpose, that God has a plan. 
Now, this was really unusual for old Caleb because you know what happened to all of his friends except for Joshua? They were dead, that's right. He was one of the 12 spies that went out into Kadesh Barnea to see how they were to take the land that God had promised them. But the majority report says we can't take it. There are giants in there. They have walls. And the fortified city and the hearts of the people melted. So to reward them, they died in the desert. But here, old Caleb is still alive. You know what made him so healthy? He served as pallbearers for all of his friends. Man, just imagine it, all the exercise that he got. But he said, I'm here today, and I am here for a reason. Now, I want to emphasize something to you, and I hope that you believe that you're here for a reason. You're here inside this building for a reason. But you're alive today for a reason. God has a plan, and God has a purpose for you, and he has a job, especially for you. And so often, people just want to quit. My first full-time church was not too far from here over in Lawrence County, Mount Horror Baptist Church. And one day, one of the deacons by the name of Alex came to me and he said, Preacher, I'm just going to retire and let some of the younger ones take over. Old man Alex was about 50 years old. You know, some people, they can't quit. Excuse my grammar because I ain't ever got started. Not old Caleb. He realized something. Whether we're 8, 18, 80, or 118, God has a purpose. God has a plan for my life and your life. Now, it would be amiss if I indicated that age didn't make a difference. You know, age makes a difference. There's some things that older people just can't do. One thing that, that I, I have dreamed of for this congregation and don't know if we'll ever get there or not, but I, I wanted to see a multi-purpose building with a full-size gym in it where we could institute the upward basketball program. I think that would be a great outreach for kids. I mean, they love sports, right? Get them in to play basketball and tell them about Jesus. But let's just suppose that we were starting an upward basketball league. I don't think Gene Fannin would be much of an asset to a basketball team. Do you? He can't jump. He can't run. He just, he might be a cheerleader, but he'd be an ugly one, wouldn't he? You know, if some of you decided that you're going to do the twist on Sunday, you'd be in traction on Monday, wouldn't you? I mean, as we age, man, our body just begins to give out, doesn't it? I got an email, I think it was from Mark Ross, that said the golden years turned out to be rust. But there are some things that only an aged person can do. You know why? Because age brings experience. I mentioned earlier, I, I'll try to tell that little upstart right there something sometimes. He'll look at me like, if you only knew. He don't know that I do know. Because he didn't realize that back in the 1970s, <clears throat> They had teenagers, all right, the 60s. Did you know they had teenagers back then? Amazing, isn't it? I know what it's like to be 14, 15, 16 years old. He doesn't know what it's like to be an old man of 50 like me. You know, if you live to be 65, 70, 75, 85 years old, you don't learn some things. You're worse than a slow learner, aren't you? I've told you before, my father made it through the third grade. One of the most intelligent men I've ever met. When I was growing up, he'd tell me, son, you better not, and I would. And I'd find out I shouldn't have. Every time. How'd he learn that? Experience. But you know what? There's some things that only young folks can do. There really is. That, that, that. Athleticism, that energy. We sometimes say that youth are the church of tomorrow. But they're Christians. They're part of the church today. They're tomorrow. 
And there's some things that any age person can do. Have you ever thought about the fact that age is irrelevant to God? How old is he? Wow. I can recall two distinct teachings in the Bible about age. One is repeated over and over again in various ways, but it says in essence, respect the older person. Things in Proverbs like that, that gray hair is a symbol of wisdom. I've got it oozing out all over the place. Hasn't it? Some of you ladies trying to dye yours and color it up. But there's another passage where Paul is writing to Timothy and he says, despise not your youth. Now he's not saying don't hate your teenagers. He's saying if you're a young person, don't say, boy, I wish I was older. What's he saying? Whether we're young or old, in the eyes of God, that is irrelevant to service and faithfulness. God has a plan for you at any age, at every age. Second thing, if we're really going to accomplish more than ever before, is like Caleb, we have to have a desire to be a useful servant. You see, it's one thing to know that God has a plan. It's another thing to get busy fulfilling that plan. Caleb knew that there was a mountain to claim. Isn't it amazing he's 85 years old? And a lot of 85-year-old men, if they 